Assalamu alaikum everyone. In the past few videos, we've discussed about Newton's laws of motion, apparent weight, weight, the normal force. However, in these videos, we've used these laws that seem to not comply as much with reality as, as at least what we see in reality. For example, let's take Newton's first law. An object shall remain at rest or in motion unless a force is applied to it. However, we don't really see it that much in real life. Sure, we see the first part. For example, this glue is perfectly still until I apply a force to it. However, the same cannot be said about the second part of the law. For example, I have this crate and I have a chess piece on top of it. Now, if I were to move this chess piece, if I were to move this chess piece, you can see that the moment I leave my hand, the chess piece gets perfectly still. I'm not applying any force to break it. I'm not grabbing I'm not grabbing the chess piece like this. I just move it gently and still it is perfectly still. It does not move according to Newton's first law of motion. But why is that? This is because as we talked in our inertial frame of reference video, most of the universe is in space and very little of it is in Earth. These laws adhere to space which has very little variables. I mean, let's take the four fundamental forces. There's barely any strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force enough to cause this kind of disruption. Electromagnetic force doesn't really do much in space. And gravity, which is pretty much the most distant force that can act, does not affect your body as much. So what really is going on here? You see, in Earth, the problem is there are way too many variables. And some of these variables include some form of friction. Now, to explain it in a very simple way, friction is a surface's resistance to an object's motion. Meaning, we use Newton's third law, that an action will have an equal and opposite reaction. Here the pair is the force I'm applying and the force this box is applying to the chess piece to stop it from moving. And that is what we call friction. If my force that I'm applying is higher than the maximum amount of friction that is in this box, in this surface, then an object will move. However, if the force is less, the object will remain still. This pretty much saves Newton's first law, that an object will remain in motion or at rest unless a force is being applied to it. This time, the force is friction. And every kind of surface will have its coefficient of friction, which we symbolize by this Greek letter. There are two types of friction. One is static friction and the other is kinetic friction. Static friction is the type of friction that happens when an object is at rest and it resists the initiation of the motion. For Let me show the box again. The fact that I'm moving my king here, there is something that's resisting me that's trying to stop me from moving the king, from starting to move the king. That's the static friction of the box. And this kind of static friction is proportional to an object's normal force. So the object itself is pressing on the box through its weight and the force it's being applied to it. The box is applying a reverse force of the normal force and the frictional force and the frictional force is proportional to the normal force 
as the object gets bigger it will have a bigger normal force and it will have more friction as it takes more force to push the object this can be explained from the equation of the following the maximum amount of friction is equal to the coefficient of friction static friction in the surface and the amount of force used to move an object now this coefficient of friction is different depend depending on the surface and the thing you're using on the surface meaning for example glass two for example glass on glass that has a coefficient of friction of 0.94 or steel on steel which has a friction of 0.74 or wood on wood which has a friction of 0.25 to 0.5 now the smoother the surface the lesser the coefficient of friction whereas the more rough the surface is the higher the coefficient of friction that's why sandpaper feels more rough than hockey on ice however even if an a surface feels perfectly smooth for example this box again it looks smooth but it has these tiny tiny little imperfections that cause the friction and on the molecular level the electrons interact with each other in this movement which kind of stops tries to resist the motion itself so that means even if an object looks very smooth it's not as smooth to give you an example if the earth was shrunk to the size of a ping um, to the size of a pool ball it will be smoother than any pool ball ever manufactured. Yeah, that pool ball that looks very smooth is more rough than the earth with all its mountains, valleys, trenches, everything. The next type of friction is called kinetic friction. And this resists the motion of the object itself. Now, kinetic friction is always less than static friction for example glass on glass static friction is 0 0.94 as we discussed steel on steel is 0 0.74 copper and steel is 0 0.53 ice is 0 0.1 and here's the kinetic friction glass is 0 0.4 steel is 0 0.557 copper to steel is 0 0.36 and ice on ice is 0 0.03 that means that when an object actually starts moving the friction becomes less now you may be thinking so isn't friction a bit of a nuisance like you're trying to move something but it just stops all that motion it resists all that motion isn't it a bit of a nuisance for us well yes friction is a big pain in pretty much anything however friction can also be useful for example we use static for static friction in walking this grip between our leg and the ground helps us propel us forward to help us walk same for kinetic friction for example Cars tires will have grooves which will maintain traction on the ground even if water is on the surface. Meaning, if for example you're driving and you hit a puddle or something like that where there is water, the naturally anything that is in motion there will slip. However, the car won't slip because the tire has certain grooves which helps them keep in contact with the ground, utilize that friction to maintain traction and actually grip the car and move. And there's also air resistance, which is another form of friction, which is utilized by aircraft, uh, many types of vehicles, etc. So now we have the 
the big vectors which will be coming up in all types of free body diagrams. These are a bit of a summary of all the variables that we need. For example, the force applied, static friction, kinetic friction, weight, and normal force. Now we are able to analyze free body diagrams. For example, there is this inclined plane. Here, as we can see, the weight of the object is always pointed down, which we can defer, which we can refer to as mg cosine theta and mg sine theta. mg sine theta is the object that's is the thing that makes the object slide down the slope. We of course have the normal force that is that is right opposite of mg cosine theta and now we have friction if we're trying to calculate the net force of this surface we would have to take the frictional force and we have to add the weight times the sine of the angle that this slope is on so that's all there is to it thank you for watching please make sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment about anything you want to say maybe it's what i missed maybe it's a confusion or maybe it's just something you like to see and thank you for watching and i will see you next time bye